hanging out by these trees. To your left, we have some hooded mergansers. The brown ones are the females. I see one or two males. The ones with the black and white heads are the males. Oftentimes with uh, ducks, the males are visually more striking. They want to attract the female's attention. Looks like it's working. We might have some black vultures up in the trees. I, I can't really see from back here, but these big black birds up there are migratory and uh, they're called black vultures. We got a gator to your left right there in the middle, kind of behind some of y'all. If y'all don't see it, it's doing its job. Yeah. Gators are ambush predators that and, uh, evolved to look like a log or a branch. Got an anhinga to your left, the snake bird in the water. If you saw that long skinny neck, that is the snake bird. There it is. The bird that swims like a snake. They fly like a turkey. They are very graceful in the water. There it is. The anhinga has a spear-like razor sharp bill. Uh, that's how they kill fish. They stab fish all the way through. The fish will get stuck on these barbs they have on their bill and they'll throw the fish in the air and swallow the whole thing. Now we're going to see another type of diving bird that kind of looks like an anhinga, uh, but it's a different species. We have the double crested cormorant coming up on the right. We've got three of them. Now these birds hang out around salt water as well, and they have a nice little hook on their bill so they can snare fish, unlike the anhinga. Um, see these around salt water as well, and these are moorhens hanging out with these cormorants. These birds with the candy corn bills or moorhens or Florida gallinules. I like their local name. Moorhens around here are called swamp chickens. They kind of sound like chickens. They have long yellow chicken feet. Probably tastes like chicken. I'm sure someone in this county has tried one. Gators love them too. Gators love a bird that can't swim or fly very well. All right, look out to the woods every now and then too in the morning. Sometimes we'll see white-tailed deer, raccoons. Every now and then we'll see a Florida black bear. Uh, these are all crepuscular animals, animals more active in the morning and the evening. Most of the activity is going to be here on the water though. Got plenty more bald cypress trees in front of us. Um, one reason these trees can live so long is they're very anchored down. You'll notice around a lot of them, these tall knobby things, these are called cypress knees. They're not little trees. These knees are the roots of the bald cypress tree. The roots go in the ground and back up to the surface, anchoring the tree down. And a lot of animals hang out around these islands, too. We might see some uh, activity around these islands. This boat channel varies from three to eight feet deep outside the channel. Uh, it's about a foot deep today. There's a female anhinga behind you on the left right there. That's a female snake bird. Female snake birds are blonde, as you can see. Males are mostly black. We've got a, an American coot in the water to your left. That black bird with the white bill is the American coot, the crazy coot. Related to the moorhen, uh, they kind of sound like chickens too. Now right there in the middle of the river, at the very top of that bald cypress tree, we have an osprey nest. I don't know if the ospreys are up there because I can't see from back here, but it's kind of a, a bird of prey that looks like a bald eagle, but they're a lot smaller and a lot more aggressive. They keep eagles and vultures away from that nest, uh, especially uh, this time of year. We do see eagles sometimes, though. Have we seen them here? Oh yeah, keep your head on a swivel. Gators could be anywhere. Typically on a kind of a cloudy morning, cooler morning, they're gonna be in the water. Uh, we might just see the eye bumps and nose bumps of the gator. And sometimes they hold their breath. They can hold their breath for over an hour. So you might see them uh, in the channel. So keep your eyes I'll try to find you one. Hopefully they heard the song and showed up. got a white ibis coming up to your left. It's about 10 feet up in this tree, this bald cypress tree to your left. You might have to kind of, as we go past it, look behind you. That's uh, often called the hurricane bird. The ibis can sense barometric 
pressured with that long bill it has. So if you see a bunch of them flying away, you should fly away too. They know when a big storm's gonna hit. That's the white ibis. Looks like it came out of a Dr. Seuss book. Now that bill is kind of like a straw too. They often root around the eelgrass and mud looking for their favorite snack crawfish, or mud bugs. Got a lot of eelgrass here. It's long, snaky grass is what uh, manatees eat as well. They love the roots of it. So look in the water. We might see some manatees through here. It's a big aquatic mammal. They can be about 10 feet long and 1,200 pounds of mostly muscle. You think a manatee would be blubber, but they're less than 4% body fat. Some have been spotted in this area. I don't see any yet. They do love this eelgrass salad here. I love the roots of it. Got a female anhinga to your right, holding her wings out until they dry off. And we also have uh, Wakulla County's on the roller coaster on the right, the railroad to nowhere, our dry dock. Okay, we got manatees behind us to your left. They're hiding down oh, there. There's some down there. About 20 feet over. Yep. You might see them on the way up too. Yeah, there's enough there. You call that a herd. One's coming up to get oxygen if you look behind you. And we might see them on the way up too. probably see more a little further down. I think there's some on the other side too, I'll point out to you, very cool. Got a female anhinga coming up on the left from this little bald cypress tree. These boats you see in the park are the only ones allowed on this portion of the river. So all these amazing animals see them every day and they're pretty used to them as you've noticed. So we can get pretty, pretty close. In fact, this river is fenced off about three miles from here to keep other boats out to help protect this wildlife sanctuary. This has been a, a wildlife sanctuary since 1934, so nine, 90 years now. This is a pretty untouched part of old Florida, Fish basically. Camping. We've got a male anhinga coming up on your left right there. As you can see, the, the male snake bird is darker. The female has a blonde head. If you're a diving bird, you want to be right above the water like that so you can see that the fish beneath you, uh, like mullet, the jumping fish that you see out in the ocean too, and uh, bass even, but typically they're going after smaller stuff like, like rim, mosquito fish. Yeah, just keep your eyes peeled for those manatees. Where you see some, there might be more. They tend to aggregate. They're pretty social like any uh, aquatic mammal. I want to point out a pretty good example of what an alligator drag looks like. If you look into the woods, like start looking on the right, up in the meadow here, you'll notice these yeah. muddy trails. Gators will drag their bellies across the vegetation to make a nice path of least resistance, and they're doing that for other animals, like a great blue heron right here. This is the biggest bird we see on the tour, great blue heron. Um, so gators want to entice any kind of animal to walk down that trail and the gator will ambush whatever gets too close. Now, luckily gators don't eat a lot. They have a very slow metabolism being cold blooded. So during the fall and winter, typically a gator's gonna eat about once a month. That's it, once a month. Now the great blue heron is a baby gator's enemy. Uh, I've seen a great blue heron eat a nine inch long baby gator. But once the gator's all grown up, it kind of goes the other way around. All right, I want to point out my favorite tree on the tour route. We got a 600 year old bald cypress tree to your right. That big one has been hollowed out by time and by lightning, yet it still lives. It's in the same family as the, uh, the sequoia tree, strangely enough. It's a very tough kind of tree. Uh, now the Native Americans here would often make their canoes out of that kind of wood. It doesn't get water or insect damage. Uh, gator on the right, if you don't see it, it's doing its job. It's about 50 feet to the right. They evolved to be an mm. ambush predator. So they, mm. this is what they do. Absolutely nothing there. until something gets too close. 
Uh, and if they build up enough energy during the day by warming up their cold blood, they can move 30 miles an hour in the water. And typically we see more on the other side. It, it tends to get a little warmer, a little sunnier, so we might see more on the way up. down we're going to take a left here in a second but check out this view to your right uh, this part the next three miles of the river is uh, part of the wildlife sanctuary where no one's allowed to go except for its staff and that's uh, about once or twice a year so it's a very untouched part of old Florida left for the animals I think we need more places like that that fence is about three miles from here Animals like manatees can go right beneath the fence just to keep other boats out. down to your right there yellow crown night here probably a couple in there they always look grumpy during the day these are night hunters I love that yellow plumage on its head mm -hmm. hard to see yeah they really blend in I expect it more yellow it's a great view going up too I love seeing these ancient bald cypress trees with all the Spanish moss hanging down uh, Spanish moss is interesting. The stuff you see hanging down isn't Spanish or even moss. It's a, a native air plant that gets all the nutrients it needs from the air. It doesn't harm the tree. I wouldn't pick it up though. When it falls on the ground, sometimes little spider mites or red bugs, sometimes called chiggers, can infest it. Uh, the Native Americans would smoke it out before using it. They'd use the stuff as rope, as insulation, uh, as bedding, but they'd smoke out those red bugs, that's a trick they never taught the Spanish when they came up here. 1500s, yeah. And it's called Spanish moss because the French thought it looked like a Spanish beard, so it got that nickname. plants all these reeds you see all these tall skinny reeds are called bulrush and that is what apple snails lay their eggs on sometimes you see little white eggs on bulrush the apple snail is north america's largest snail it's about the size of a golf ball and that's what it, uh, the limpkin eats that's the crying bird we'll call it refers to river the crying bird we don't see a lot of limpkins these days but they're still around and they they love uh apple snails so this bulrush is very vital to the ecosystem for, for uh, something like the snail and the limpkin. All right, we got some swamp chickens on the right-hand side hanging out with the hurricane bird. White ibis. We might see some young gators hanging out here, too. We're not far from uh, an alligator nest, so keep your eyes peeled. I'll point out the general area where it is. Over here on the right behind the sawgrass, a tall grassy vegetation is called uh, sawgrass. Te technically, it's a sedge, so you can call it sausage, really. 
on all this is a gator nest. I don't see any right now, but in the late springtime, every few years, a mother gator will clump up rotting vegetation a few feet high. And this uh, composting vegetation is what warms up the 60 eggs she lays in there. Uh, so she doesn't have to lay on the eggs. This, this rotting vegetation does the work. Uh, about 10 out of 60 of these babies survive. I do see one to the, to the left right there. It's a young one. It's kind of hiding behind the bulrush. If you don't see it, it's doing its job. That's not a baby. That's, that could be the mother, actually, the most dangerous kind of gator. Um, she will fight off mainly other gators to protect her young. Big birds like great blue herons and great egrets go after these babies, too. So 10 out of 60 survive. There's one to your right, right there in the water. This one's probably about four years old. They grow about a foot a year. There's a beautiful spider lily over there to the right. To that beautiful white flower is uh, pretty rare, actually. And when it's warm enough, it blooms. I'm on the wrong side. Very cool. <laughs> That's all right. Territorial birds. I often see uh, this one on the right hand side hanging out there on that branch. That's its little fishing hole. They tend to fish from the same area, sometimes for years. It doesn't have leaves right now, but it's the one overhanging the water right next to you here on the right-hand side. This is a tree that has uh, medicinal properties like aspirin. Native Americans would make uh, a pain-relieving tea by boiling down some of the leaves and the bark of that tree. So that's a very important tree there. Uh, diving birds like anhingas love it as well. All right, we got a manatee to your left. It's about 50 feet over. Looks like a big gray rock down there. I call them swamp taters. Moving right there. Yeah, they look smaller in the water, but a manatee can be eight to thirteen feet long, uh, twelve hundred pounds, two thousand pounds of muscle. The females get bigger. Uh, again, they're less than four percent body fat, so they don't have a natural yeah. predator. A shark or a gator isn't going to mess with anything that big. Their number one enemy are, are boats, people. Uh, that's why we put propeller guards on our boats here and take it slow, so they're safe up here. You'll see a lot of white scars on the manatee from boat propellers. Now, manatees are often called sea cows. They, they are uh, big the herbivores so that eat a couple hundred pounds of vegetation chair. a day. So that's a pretty good nickname for them. But the closest living relative of the manatee is something big and gray that lives on land and it has a trunk. Oh. The elephant. Yeah. We call them wolf elephants here in Wakala County. The wolf elephant does have a small trunk and they have the same kind of teeth as elephants. They don't have a lot of hair, they have whiskers, uh, so they can feel around the dark water. coming up on the right uh, they can get up to six feet tall um, and again these are the roots of that bald cypress tree right there the roots go in the ground and back up to the surface anchoring that tree down uh, now cypress knees are protected in Florida now they're, they're very vital to these trees but in the old days of Florida people would cut them down sometimes to make things out of them like lamp um, posts um, furniture legs clocks all kinds of things but they are protected now in Florida All right. 
right, we got some white ibises coming up on the right, and she's probably not going to be there right now, but sometimes we see a, a mother gator hiding in the vegetation here. That's kind of a bad place to hang out if you're an ibis. She's very protective of her young. That's a snowy egret, too, hanging out with the white ibis. They have yellow slippers on their feet. They have bright yellow feet. Yeah, I don't see the mama right now. She isn't far away, though. Her baby's hatched about a, a year ago, so they're about a foot long right now. She's quite protective of them. But we're catching up with the biggest bird we see on the tour. We got a great blue heron. One morning, I saw one eating what I thought was a snake, but it was uh, a nine-inch long baby gator. They'll break the neck and swallow the whole thing. Welcome to the Nature Channel. Said hello to us. All right. summer you see uh, a lot more gators especially over here on the right this is kind of the alligator alley here uh, we do have one hiding in the water to your right and when they don't have any mud on them you see how dark they are they're not green gators are a dark gray reptile they, they almost appear to be black now that one's full grown they hit about seven or eight feet and after that they they slowly grow they never stop growing but they slowly grow after that so the great blue heron to the right. I feel sorry for whatever it's looking at. I've seen him catch bullfrogs, snakes, baby gators, fish mainly, but not always. Anyway, years ago, they found a, a gator out in Louisiana that was 21 feet long. This boat's about 30 feet long. Uh, and this gator, they think, was uh, 122 years old. That's unusual, but it happens sometimes. All right, let's go check on the jungle straight ahead. I like to call this area the movie channel. This is why I was singing about Tarzan and the creature from the Black Lagoon. We're also going to see the second biggest bird we see on the tour. We got a great egret coming up on the right. The beautiful great egret. They often compete with the great blue heron. They, they are herons themselves. Now they kind of move their neck side to side like a snake before they strike. So I can see something. Got a little mosquito fish, I think. <laughs> ecologically diverse place we have all kinds of trees all kinds of plants in general and all kinds of animals so you can kind of imagine being maybe in the Amazon or the deepest part of the jungle of Africa use your imagination um, the first big movie filmed back here is in 1941 and it's called Tarzan's secret treasure welcome to the jungle this movie starred Johnny Weisbuehler uh, he was famous as a swimmer and diver he won some Olympic gold medals actually, and he came up with that very famous Tarzan yell himself by yodeling. He was a great yodeler from Europe. A lot of scenes were filmed in this area. Uh, there's a nice cabbage palm tree straight ahead on the right hand side. That was in the Tarzan movie. We used to have one that grew right next to it, kind of curved up out of the water so high the old boats could go right underneath it. This is the one you see Tarzan on. Now, 
Back in the 40s, uh, it was a different time. This was not a state park, so the rules were quite a bit more lax. The film crew brought some Asian elephants back here somehow, and Reese's monkeys to make it seem more jungly. Uh, luckily, somehow, these animals did not escape. Um, but when they filmed down at Silver Springs, around Ocala, some Reese's monkeys got loose. And to this day, you'll see them everywhere. Their progeny is everywhere there, having a great time. <laughs> In 1954, another movie is filmed back here called The Creature from the Black Lagoon. Back then, this channel used to keep going straight, right in front of us, deep into the swamp. We're going to take a left because I don't want this tour to get too exciting. This is uh, kind of the lair of the creature in some scenes, the deepest part of the Amazon, and this was a terrifying movie back in the 50s. The second 3D movie ever done, so it was kind of cutting edge, too. At, at this point, though, I think it's one of the greatest comedies ever. It is cheesy, cheesy fun, uh, but a, a great movie in its own way. Uh, the neatest thing is the guy playing the creature and all the underwater scenes uh, filmed here. This guy was a lifeguard that worked here named Rico Browning. He didn't mind being around all the wildlife. He was a Florida guy and he uh, could swim in a costume that weighed 80 pounds. Uh, not an easy job. Rico went on to create the show Flipper back in the 60s, worked on the show Sea Hunt. Worked on James Bond movies, like Thunderball. Worked on Caddyshack, even. All kinds of weird stuff. Check them out. Rico Browning. Lesser known movies, like Joe Panther, were filmed here. And uh, Air Force 77 was filmed around the spring. Uh, that was the Bermuda Triangle in the movie. You can imagine that. Yellow Crown Night here and up here to your right, kind of back where I'm at now, a little bit above our heads. You might see more. Always looking grumpy during the day. These are night hunters. And we do see snakes back here sometimes, especially during the summer. Um, most of them are non venomous. We see a lot of groundwater snakes which kind of look like moccasins, but their heads are smaller and they're not venomous. Uh, this water is typically too cold for moccasins, so I'm okay with that. Uh, we do have banded water snakes, mud snakes. Sometimes oak snakes are up in the tree branches, so I always avoid the branches during the summer. Um, but luckily we don't have a problem with Burmese pythons like in the Everglades. It gets too cold in this part of Florida. That's one reason we don't have them, but we do have snakes back here. They often wrap around these cypress knees, too, sometimes. So this became a, a state park in 1986, and it's called Wakulla Springs because we have more than one spring. We got uh, a small one at the entrance of the park as well called the Sally Ward Spring. And here on the right-hand side, you're seeing the Sally Ward Spring Run. This is uh, about a mile-long run uh, that adds about 2% of what becomes Wakulla River. And look how clear the water is on the right-hand side compared to uh, the left-hand side. There's less tannins in this part because the uh, Sally Ward Spring gets its water from so deep within the Florida and aquifer, the tannins from forest debris get more filtered out. Uh, Florida's an interesting place. We have more freshwater springs than any other place in the world, and that's because the bedrock of Florida uh, is a very soft kind of rock karst limestone, it's like cottage cheese basically. So over millions of years, the acidity of rain carved out these tunnels beneath this, creating the aquifer. So when it rains in Florida and some parts of South Georgia, the rain filters down through forest debris, adding a lot of tannins to the water, and then it filters down into these caves. And uh, pressure builds up, pressure comes out in the form of a spring like we have in front of us. Uh, this is the world's biggest single vent spring out here. We're going to go right over. This is where 98% of Wakulla River comes from. Now, if you look at our dive tower, you'll notice that white buoy in front of it. 185 feet beneath it, we have an eight-story cave that is wide enough a four-lane highway could fit through it. It is a part of the aquifer beneath us. So this cave is pumping out about 200 to 600 million gallons of fresh water every single day. 
That's enough water to fill up an Olympic-sized swimming pool every minute. It's a mind-boggling amount of water. Um, you can still tell it's kind of shallow here, but we're about to go over the spring bowl. You'll see where you can't really see down that well anymore. Uh, the spring bowl is very deep. It's 125 feet down in some areas. Coming up on the right, you'll start seeing these steep slope, sloping coarse limestone walls over here. These walls eventually funnel down to that giant cave. So this is kind of a tornado shaped spring bowl. Um, we're seeing about 15 feet down today. The water has a lot of tannins in it from the storms we've had in the past few months. So it's still pretty dark. Typically late spring after a pretty long drought, we can see about 80 feet down. It's kind of a good time to visit too. Unfortunately, in the past uh, few decades, the development in the area has introduced more nitrates into the aquifer. Most of these nitrates are coming from the use of fertilizer. Nitrates cause a lot of algae to grow. And when algae dies, it releases chlorophyll, which is very green. So over the past uh, 10 years, especially, it's gotten more and more green here. And we haven't done a glass bottom boat tour in seven years. We have to see uh, a lot deeper down to make that worth it. We do these tours every day, but uh, the glass bottom boat tour hasn't happened in a while, but hopefully one day we can do that again for you. Now this dive tower used to be a lot taller. It was a three-story wooden structure, about 40 feet tall, that would sway in the wind sometimes. When the state took over in 1986, we made it like what you see here, a little safer. Maybe not as much fun, but a little safer. Still a great view. And if you uh, jump in the water where it's roped off, it's 26 feet deep. It's right above this coarse limestone shelf. That shelf extends out here, and then it drops off in this area down to 125 feet down. And right beneath us here, we have some mastodon bones from the Ice Age. You can't see them. Uh, they're so deep down, but uh, this was probably a sinkhole during the Ice Age that eventually caved in along with a lot of uh, prehistoric megafauna like the, the mastodon. To this day, some of those bones are down there. We have a nice mastodon femur bone in our waterfront office that was found at the very bottom there. Um, in fact, Tallahassee at the Museum of Florida Natural History has a mastodon skeleton that was found at the bottom there. Some scientists went down there years ago in the 30s and they uh, pieced these bones back together. They wired them together over two years. And now Tallahassee has that in a museum that's been closed for a few years. But hopefully one day they can reopen. You'll see Herman, the mastodon up there.